Beloved community, grace and peace to you from the one who calls us to dwell in love's heart day and night so that we might be like trees planted by the water. Whether you are part of First Church, an inclusive and justice-seeking church in the heart of our nation's capital, or whether you are a friend or a guest joining us from many different locations, we welcome you to worship on this Communion Sunday as we continue the theme, Rooted in Love. I invite you to show up just as you are today with your questions or certainties, with joy or in grief, weary or grateful. There are many ways to participate in today's service in song and prayer, perhaps by setting your table at home with the elements of bread and cup, which we will bless together. So attune to the spirit and move as you feel moved. Bring the fullness of who you are to this hour of worship, for wide is God's welcome. We remain in phase three of our regathering plan, and every Sunday we welcome 25 people to worship with us in the sanctuary while others join us by Zoom for hybrid worship. As a reminder to those in the sanctuary, please do remain masked, observe distancing, and we invite you to hum rather than sing our hymns today. Helping us with technology, Abigail Ciparoni will serve as our Zoom moderator, Tom Sowers as our sound designer, Dennis Turner as our guest musician, and Lucille Dickinson has prepared our communion table today. Thank you to all of them and to Reverend Sam and our middle school youth for making today's service possible. Following worship, please do join us for a time of fellowship with one another here in the sanctuary or through our Zoom coffee hour. And now let us cross the threshold into worship. Please rise in body or in spirit for our opening hymn, Come, O Fount of Every Blessing. Good morning, First Church, friends, and those of us who are here for us the first time. These last five weeks, the middle school and I have spent reading and discussing this book, Harbor Me, by Jacqueline Woodson. 
It is a book about six seventh graders at a junior high in Brooklyn, New York. While on the surface, the one thing shared by all these students is that they are in a special education class taught by Miss Laverne. But soon they realize they have more in common. Early into the semester, Miss Laverne realizes that each of them have complicated lives outside of school. And that school, in the traditional sense, wasn't providing them the space to process all that life is throwing their way. So she has a radical idea. It is in, rooted in this notion of the power of pure listening and truth sharing. So on a Friday in the fall, she asks them to follow her to a room, soon to be called ARTT, a room to talk, where for one hour each Friday, Haley, Holly, Tiago, Esteban, Amari, and Ashton would be together, unproctored by any adult. Here, they would do a lot of things, share stories of frustration, stories of joy, tease one another, rest, and just be. But most importantly, they would reveal to one another the fullness of each person's life and its complexities. Whether it was Esteban, whose father was recently detained by ICE and risked deportation back to the Dominican Republic, Amari, who is African American, and his father would not let him play with the Nerf gun because of fear of what police would do. Haley, who is trying to love and forgive her father who is in prison, but soon to return. Holly, who wrestles with what it comes, with what it means to come from a more privileged background than her classmates. Tiago, whose family is from Puerto Rico and is frustrated by so many encounters where he and his mom are made to feel diminished, less American just because Spanish is their comfortable language, despite the fact that they grew up in this country too. And Ashton, who as a white student is a minority in the classroom and struggles with understanding the reality of racism in the world. Together, the six of them, they open up, they share stories, they reveal their true selves. The result, deep affection and love for one another. Middle in the book, Amari tells Esteban, we got you, bro. It is this type of affection that creates strong communities and families. It is this type of affection where we see a glimpse of what God's beloved community looks like. However, to get there, we need to open up be willing to be vulnerable to our friends and those we look up to, willing to go the extra mile to love one another. We are called to harbor one another from the dangers of society, whether that is racism, sexism, poverty, violence, judgment, or downright meanness. Journeying along these five middle schoolers has been a highlight in my ministry. I have marveled at not how not only how seriously they have read this book, but how they have very much embodied the type of listening and communication necessary to create strong communities. They've wrestled with tough topics like racial justice, deep listening, seeing things from other people's perspectives, forgiveness, and reconciliation. It is a great privilege to welcome Louisa and Brendan as they lead us in the call to worship followed by Charlie and Miyako as they lead us in the confession and words of assurance. And Natalie will be our scripture reader. Thank you. We need to harbor one another by offering forgiveness. Harbor me, we realize that forgiveness is hard but important. In harbor me, Haley's dad is in prison and has been for a very long time. And only once every other month, so that's like once in eight or nine weeks that she gets to visit him. Imagine only seeing your father every other month. If it were me, I'd probably be really looking forward to it when the time came. So imagine how Haley felt when her dad didn't show up. Upset, hurt, betrayed, sad, angry, and a bunch of other negative emotions. But while she was mad, 
the next time she saw him, she forgave him. Was it hard? Yes, it was probably really hard for her to do, but she did it anyway. Not right away, of course, but eventually she did forgive him. Forgiveness brings out the true good in all of us. It shows that we can not only accept when someone has done something hurtful or disappointing to us, but also move past it. It shows our ability to be flexible. And perhaps most importantly, it shows the depth, the capacity of kindness a person can truly show. Forgiveness is important for all of us. Remember to use it. We need to harbor one another by creating safe places built upon trust and friendship. We need to create spaces where we can be vulnerable around our friends and family so they can be there when we need help and we can be there for them too. When I read Harbor Me, my view on relying on others changed. It changed because everyone in the book had experienced or was going through a hard time and all the characters relied on each other a lot to help them get through these difficulties. One example in the book is where Esteban came to school really sad and he tells everyone about how his dad has been detained and he might be sent back to the Dominican Republic. Further into the story, Esteban's dad sends him a poem and Esteban reads it aloud to the group. Next, everyone says the poem is beautiful and the support shows that they want the best for his dad and Esteban. We need to create safe spaces where we can trust and rely on a upon one another. And now we will hear the confession and words of assurance. For, forgive us when we forget what true equality and true fairness means. When we think of the, of the future, our future, too, too often it means immigrants and other people aren't treated the same, but it should mean everyone is equal. In harmony, my idea of equality was challenged when we learned that Esteban's dad was taken away. Also, when Haley's dad and mom were in a car accident, Haley's dad was put in jail. This shows that there is not full equality in the country. I think equality is giving fairness to everybody in the country, in America, our, our lives, in the world. It made me think that now I'm not, I'm not going through these things, but many people are. This makes me think that America has a long way to go. But I think that the equality is not a myth that people want to believe. I think that it is possible with a lot of work. Okay. Forgive us when we are too quick to judge others. Everyone has a story. Everyone wants to be seen, to be heard, and to be understood. In Harvey Me, some of the friends are hurt were hurt when well um Haley was hurt when her dad didn't show up when she when he, when he was when she went to visit him and she felt hurt because she doesn't get to see him that often and she didn't understand why he wouldn't show up so he she was also kind of mad at him for not showing up and um Amari was hurt when when Ashton was saying that he says that if people didn't talk about racism he said they it might it wouldn't exist and um Amari was hurt by that he was also mostly mad at him but then they forgave each other but yeah um okay oh god you have loved us from the beginning you understand us in our fullness you allow us to be honest about our fears and our wants. so now and still with in us your loving grace, so that we may be the listeners, the healers, the bridge builders, the justice superheroes, the friends this world so desperately needs. 
We know you will. Amen. Let us let us thank the middle school youth for doing such a great job. So good. They really gave their heart and, and, and dedicated their time. Not many middle schoolers are going to want to read a book and hang out with me upon school and stuff. So they were, they were all stars. I'm so grateful for that. And now, um, um, it was a real privilege, and now I want to welcome Karen Pence to lead us in our stewardship moment. Okay, can, can someone give me a thumbs up to say you can hear me and I've done, woohoo! Okay, good morning, First Church, and it's wonderful to see all of your faces. Um, you know, when I first wrestled with this question, why do I give, to my surprise, my mind went back to this childhood memory. So it was kind of early fall, I was maybe 14, my brother was 10, we were lounging around the house on a late Sunday afternoon. My father came home from church, he had stayed later for some reason, and his face was not pleased. And the reason he was not pleased became clear when he handed us our pledge statements. So um, Christ Congregational Church, kids pledged too. In the previous fall, we had pledged, forgotten about it, blown it off, and now we had, a, had um, accumulated this considerable arrearage to Christ Congregational Church. Um, nothing that would you know, break their budget, but large compared to our allowance at that time. And my father was quite clear we had made a commitment and we were gonna have to figure out how to pay it off. So honestly, um, ever since then, I have pledged and given and tried to do it on time. Um, but I thought, well, you know, for stewardship, you might want something a little bit more inspirational than that I give because my father was profoundly disappointed with, me, with his teenage scofflaw daughter 35 years ago. Um, and so the next thought that came to my mind was actually something that one of our great saints of the church, former Reverend John Mack said to me once, which was, and bear with me, this is gonna be unintuitive at first. He said, you belong to the UCC because no one is gonna tell you what to do. And, you know, I entertained myself for a while wondering if the UCC in fact was gonna use that as its tagline, the church where no one tells you what to do. Um, but after I kind of had entertained myself for a bit, I thought more about what I thought he meant. <clears throat> and what I thought he meant was, you know, we are a church we join by choice. We are a choice we join by covenant. And that choice, that covenant is holy and sacred and so much more profound and beautiful than doing something because you have to. And when I look at all of your faces, I am so overwhelmed by knowing that whatever I have given to this church, I have gotten back a hundredfold. And I'm actually, I might tear up here, but I'll try not to. And so this is a moment rooted in love. This is a moment rooted in covenant. This is a rooted, moment rooted in choice. And let me express my love and gratitude to all of you and ask that you join me in pledging, not because you have to, not because someone's gonna be disappointed in you, but because you choose to, do, choose to do so because of the sacred and special community that we are. Thank you. And now with full hearts, let us uh, thank one another for this community we are, we are called to be by passing the peace of Christ with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. Peace. Peace, Peace for us, Thank you, Karen. Good morning, everybody. Peace. Priscilla, it's so good to see you. One more minute. One more minute. Peace. 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 Hello, oh, Lucille. Hi. Hello, Jean. Yeah. Hey, Carol. This is <laughs> the transcripts at home. Hey, Mary Alice. Mary. <laughs> to see you all. Mark. Carol, it was wonderful to be the middle like school this morning. Thank you for that. They were yeah, wonderful. Beautiful. They really were. Oh, they mm -hmm. were terrific. Miyako did a wonderful yeah. job. Thank you, Mia, and the rest of the Dodge family there. Mm Hi, -hmm. Lagamas. Peace be with you all. It was a beautiful service yesterday. 
Yes, very. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Andy, Diana. I learned so much more about him. I had no idea he was a stay at home dad. <laughs> In the 80s, that was something. Yes. Great job, Brendan. Your mom is <laughs> proud of you. <laughs> Amen. Karen, that was good stewardship. Thank you. Well, it's so great to see all the smiles. Uh, I invite us all to return to a centering moment. Praise God, total praise. Thank you, Dennis. Amen.
A reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 38 to 44. Jesus taught, saying, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have their best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses for the sake of appearance and say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Jesus sat down opp opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow, widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out their abundance, but she out of her poverty and has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Friends, yesterday was a very busy day in the life of the church. We memorialized Don Bassler. These beautiful roses are here. I went uh, to visit our beloved Peg after that service, and she was able to talk with me. We were able to pray together. It was a very precious time. She's in hospice now, and I would invite you to continue to hold her and her family in your prayers. On my way back from visiting Peg, as I was getting closer to the church, a call came in from Gail Sonneman who said, Amanda, when you see the five fire trucks lining you know, the, the border of the church, don't be alarmed. Uh, because we had a fire in the parking lot. Um, there was a fire in the... Uh, parking lot attendant's office, and Nora had smelled it on her way uh, to, to leave, and soon we had fire trucks, and the parking lot was closed down, and um, we had folks in here who were rehearsing for the production that evening while we had strobe lights going off, but luckily no one was hurt. Um, the, the production was pushed back by 15 minutes, but everything uh, went according to plan, and last night, this place was absolutely filled with people from the community. Um, some of our beloved siblings from People's Congregational were here. Of course, the good folks from Howard University were here. It was powerful beyond the telling. And so I share all that with you to say that new life is springing forth again in this congregation. And I'm grateful, um, I'm just very grateful. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O oh God, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Early this week, I enjoyed the last of our garden raspberries and cherry tomatoes before the first frost of the season. As autumn descends with a finality, there are moments when the glory of the earth is palpable, moments when the air chills and the breath becomes visible with fog, moments of warm sun peeking through the gilded cloudscape, or a moon hanging heavy in the night sky. Moments when I sense that God is nothing but a show-off, laughing and taking me by the hand to look out over a flame of autumnal trees warming the horizon. 
Have you ever felt like God is taking notice of you? In this season, pregnant with early dusk, have you paused to drink in a holy moment? Have you lit a candle against the growing night, nourished your body with warm soup or bread, felt God's hushed presence blanket you? Our story this morning, The Tale of the Widow's Might, is at first glance about money, stewardship, and giving. But at the heart of the story is a truth so obvious it's easy to miss. Jesus noticed her. A widow, bereft of power, means, and influence, yet Jesus noticed her. The whole congregation must have known who she was, Old Mrs. Jones, bless her heart, her husband died five years ago, and every one of her seven kids are girls, all married off, no man to take care of her. They say she barely has two coins to rub together. And where would she be without the temple, without the priests to take care of her? Of course, we're the ones who really pay with our offering. I imagine over time they grew tired of the widow's constant neediness, her dependence on the congregation. It happens. Folk grow so accustomed to the poor that they become invisible. Here was someone who entered the temple gates with predictable regularity, humbled by grief and poverty. How is it that Jesus, who watched hundreds of faithful Jews make their offerings to the treasury, noticed this particular woman? The giving of tithes and offerings in Jesus' day was somewhat of a spectacle. Because the offering receptacles were metal boxes, others could literally hear the size of the offering. The louder and longer the sound of cascading coins, the larger the gift. This procession of people pouring their gifts into the temple treasury afforded the opportunity to announce one's wealth and piety all at once. But somewhere in the line stood the poor widow. She came forward and dropped two small coins worth only a penny. Jesus pulled the disciples aside. Look, he said, they gave out of their excess, but she gave out of her poverty all she had to live on. Often this story is the perfect scriptural example used by pastors to guilt their congregations into giving more. It has traditionally been interpreted as an exaltation of radical giving, and there's certainly value in that interpretation. But theologian Chad Meyer suggests that the example Jesus made of the widow was actually a lament. What does it mean when Jesus says that the scribes devour the houses of widows? Myers notes it might have been the practice by which the scribes took over the estates of widows, for, of course, women could not manage the estates left by their late husbands. And so the religious leaders kindly took over, resulting in corrupt confiscation of these properties, for a widow had no legal recourse. Yet another way of interpreting Jesus' assertion that the scribes devoured the houses of widows, is that their gifts to the temple drained them of much-needed resources, all they had to live on. Jesus was no fool. He understood that poverty, hunger, and illness have more to do with the presence of entrenched injustice than with the absence of resources. In our time, Our social contract functionally excludes the poor, even those working full-time, working two and three jobs from safe, dignified, affordable housing. Just look around here in the nation's capital. But if there was one thing that really burned Jesus up, it was the hypocrisy of the religious institutions of his day. They claimed to care for widows and orphans while preying upon them. 
We see it today, churches that guilt people into giving, that take money for po- from the poor for charities that reinforce a status quo in which the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Perhaps Jesus' message to his disciples was less about how we ought to give and more a critique of the kinds of community we've created in the name of God. Truly, our task as a community of faith is to be worthy of the kind of offering given by this widow in God's name. Researchers tell us there's no doubt the poor give disproportionately more than the wealthy giving out of their excess. It sounds counterintuitive, right? The poor give a higher percentage of their income even though they have less to live on? That's right. Studies prove it time and again. And here is Jesus' paradox that what is small and simple, considered insignificant by the world, is truly kingdom living. The widow's offering didn't turn any heads. It didn't influence big decisions or launch a major ministry, but what it represents is incredible trust in God and the kingdom reversal, that the small things of this world are powerful beyond measure. I wonder, what if the widow in this story represents God? We hear parables with wealthy landowners we imagine symbolize God, but what if this widow represents God? What if our task is to create and nurture a community worthy of God's two coins? What if living out our faith means orienting ourselves to notice God in the widow, God in the poor, and to receive their gifts as divine. Catholic worker Dorothy Day once described a Holy Thursday celebration like this. It was truly a joyful day. I was sitting at the supper table at St. Joseph House. The general appearance of the place was home-like, informal, noisy, and comfortably warm on a cold evening, and yet looked out with the eyes of a visitor, our place must look dingy indeed, filled as it always is, with people, children too, all of whom bear the unmistakable mark of misery and destitution. Are these people being rehabilitated is the question we get almost daily from visitors. One priest had his catechism class write us questions as to our work. The majority asked the same, how can you see Christ in people? And we only say, it is an act of faith, constantly repeated. It is an act of love resulting from an act of faith. It is an act of of hope that we can awaken these acts in their hearts too. And there it is, the divine breaking into the ordinary. God's simple mercies echoing from the lives of regular people who happen to live in poverty. Those are the moments in community, by the way, when you know that by God's grace you have crossed over the boundaries of charity and even the borderlines of justice into real righteous relationship. When divine grace seeks us through the most vulnerable, And we are swept up into the kingdom which is in you and in me and at hand this very hour. And here it is for us today. In these simple elements of bread and wine, it's not complicated. It's not magical. It's not prohibitive. It's as simple as mercy poured out. The love of God, blessed and broken, offered to each one of us. No exceptions. 
a basic feast. Routine, some might say, but I promise, beloved community, this table has been set for you this morning. God is our host, inviting the blessed and broken places in each one of us to rise up, to come forward as if this is the meal that breaks the fast, our last supper, nourishment for starving souls. You don't have to do anything to come to the table except lean into God's grace and give thanks. For it is here that we build a community worthy of your gifts and of God's. Amen. Dear ones, all are welcome at this table. Receive the bread and wine. Bring your sadness, anxious madness. Secrets, your loneliness. Hallelujah, sing a song of peace to me. Hallelujah, sing this unhidden melody. Hallelujah, sing in all souls residing. Hallelujah, sing. Beautiful. 
Um, for the offering, I would like to pick up again the theme of what it means as a church to harbor one another. We, yesterday, it was a big day for me too. We had our final Little League game that ended at one o'clock. And then I quickly dashed home, did my transformation to come here for Don's service, which was beautiful. But on the drive down Mass Avenue, I was delayed because hundreds of cars and buses adorned with flags of Ethiopia were all around the vice president's uh, home. They were drawing attention to the genocide, political disruption, and famine that is threatening thousands and millions of people's of lives in, our Ethi in, in Ethiopia. I bring this up because we live in a region with a significant Ethiopian population. 20 some years ago, DC passed a uh, language access law to make sure that all our services, all our documents are translated in the top six languages spoken by DC residents. All of them are in Amharic because of our, our Ethiopian brothers and sisters that live here. So I'm grateful for a city that takes seriously what it means to harbor our Ethiopian siblings. And in that same vein, whether it's through our commitment to racial justice, all the great work social action does, what Care of Parish did yesterday in caring for the Bassler family, in, 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 in the, the continuous heartfelt work of the Regathering Task Force, in Christian education, in hospitality and ushers, we take seriously what it means to harbor this church community and what it means to harbor our neighbors outside. So in that spirit, I invite you to reflect upon what it means to be a part of this community that harbors one another, and we thank God for that opportunity. So if you are here, I invite you to uh, put your collection in the plate as you leave. If you're joining us with Zoom, you can, um, there'll be a link in the chat where you can uh, support us via PayPal or Venko. Thank you so much for your consideration. Beloved community, this is the joyful feast of a people rooted in God's love. We are gathered today from the north and the south. We come in bodies, aged and youthful. We come with our faith and our doubts, bearing sorrow and buoyed by hope, possessing privilege or struggling to make ends meet. But here at this table, we are gathered into one body. Here, we are rooted in love like a tree planted by the water. This is not my table or yours. This is the table of Jesus Christ, and here all are welcome to the feast, especially those who have been in exile. You don't have to be good to come to this table, just hungry. God will do the rest. Will you pray with me? Great and gracious God, we give thanks that you called forth creation from the void and raised us from dust by the breath of your being. We bless you for the beauty of the earth and the vision of the day when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We remember the covenant you made with our ancestors in faith, a promise of forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice, and your presence in times of trial, a covenant handed down to each of us. We give thanks that you delivered your people from slavery and in the fullness of time sent Jesus Christ to share our common lot. Bind up the brokenhearted and call forth newness of life. We rejoice that you call us to reconciliation with you and all people everywhere. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who leads us into truth, defends us in adversity, and gathers us from every people to unite as one. 
Today our voices rise, mingling with that great cloud of witnesses to pray together the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples. Our God, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and and forgive us our debts as we we forgive our our debtors. debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Today, as we break the bread, I invite those at home to view this service in gallery mode so that we can lift the bread and cup together and witness the power of celebrating communion as one. So please break the bread with me and lift the cup with Reverend Sam, but wait to partake of your elements until we circle up here in the sanctuary. Friends, on the night of betrayal and desertion, and on the eve of his death, Jesus gathered with the disciples to celebrate the feast of Passover. And after supper, he took bread and, giving thanks to God, broke it and shared it with the disciples, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. In the same way, after he took took the bread, he took the cup, and after giving thanks to God, he shared it with all his disciples saying, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in, in remembrance of me. Then he gave them a new commandment, saying, love one another as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Gracious God, Send your Holy Spirit on each table of bread and cup and on us. Transform them into that sacred meal which roots us in your love. Amen. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. As we circle up, Reverend Sam and I will come around with the elements. As soon as you receive them, we invite you to partake. Let us come forward now.
We bless you, O God, for the gifts of bread and cup. As we depart from your table, move us from despair to hope, from isolation to community, from aimlessness to becoming rooted in love. Bless us with the gift of unity that we find here at the table of grace, that all the other tables in our lives may, might also become filled with your love. Amen. Amen. And friends, I invite us to return back to our seats as we sing our closing hymn. For our choral blessing, I want to remind you to check our newsletter website and Facebook page for announcements. If you are a new guest worshiping with us today, please complete the visitor's information form. That link can be found in the worship folder. 
A few announcements. First, our new administrative assistant, Trista Dunlap, started work on Friday. Please look out next week for her bio and get to know her. I want to thank Lucille Dickinson and the search team for their tremendous work in filling this position. Next Sunday, we will mark climate justice in the pulpit with the Reverend Dr. David Lindsay serving as our guest preacher. David is a faithful member of First Church, and this will be a powerful service. As a reminder, we are still in our stewardship season, so please remember to submit your financial pledge either through our online form or by dropping the pledge card into the offering plate or mailing it into the office. Following worship today, those in the sanctuary are invited to remain here to greet one another, and all on Zoom are invited to join us for our Zoom coffee hour, a time of fellowship. The optional discussion question is, what good book are you reading right now? And now I invite our First Church Choir to bless us with a sung benediction, followed by the closing voluntary. Now I walk in beauty, beauty is before me, beauty is behind me, above and below me. Now I walk in beauty, now I walk in Thank you. 